Dr. Summers, pleasure seeing you in Hong Kong. Good to be here. Again. And I want to say something I've never had a chance to say to you face to face before. You're a lot, hell of a lot better looking than the guy who played you in the social network. You know that? <laughs> much, much better. Thank you, for, um, thank you for saying that. I'm often asked um, whether that scene actually happened uh, in the movie Social Network. And the right answer is sort of. If it can be... Uh, if it's true that I can on occasion be forceful and arrogant, I probably was forceful and arrogant on uh, that particular occasion in reaching the judgment that the university should stay out of uh, that kind of intellectual dispute. I did, um, I never knew Mark Zuckerberg during his time at Harvard, but it was true that the year after that scene, I found myself in the position of having to give the welcome speech to all of our freshmen. And a young student in my office who had helped me with the speech had written a paragraph in which he had had me say to the freshmen, I look forward to friending you on the Facebook. <laughs> and I said to this young man who worked for me, I said, excuse me, you're supposed to be a Harvard student Friend is not a verb. <laughs> and he said, Larry, just read it as I wrote it, and they'll think you're cool. <laughs> and otherwise, there's not much chance of that. <laughs> I did read it, and for some brief fleeting moment, they did think I was cool. And how public is your page? Can we all friend you on Facebook now, Dr. Summers? A little less uh, public uh, than that, but I do follow uh, the company uh, closely, as you may have um, read. Uh, Sheryl Sandberg, who is the chief operating officer of, uh, face, uh, of Facebook, um, and has been a very successful uh, executive uh, there, was an undergraduate student of mine uh, at uh, Harvard, and then worked with me as my chief of staff during my time as deputy treasury secretary and as treasury secretary um, in uh, Washington before she went out to uh, Silicon uh, Valley. So I still do follow closely what happens on Facebook, but uh, mine is not a fully uh, public uh, page. But it does enable me, but it's public enough that it does enable me to watch my children's Facebook page, which seems like a good thing to be able to do. Dr. Summers, I, uh, I know everybody here. By the way, do you, you, don't, do you get crowds this size in, in the U.S.? I mean, you're a big hit. You're like a rock star here in Asia. So don't ever do public office because I don't think you can take payment for showing th up at things like this, okay? So you want to stay where you are right now. Um, I know you have a lot of wisdom to impart on us, some uh, very interesting subtopics like uh, opportunities presented by low interest rates. I just, want to, I just want to backtrack and rewind one year, about a year, at the same event in front of largely the same crowd where you were asked about the looming cliff crisis in America. And you said that barring, essentially barring any solution which picks ideas out of the loony bin, that we should be okay. I think that the cliff solution they came up with in, uh, in America was largely out of the loony bin, wasn't it? No. No. Look, the whole thing if you step back from it, has something quite bizarre about it. There's a theory of automobile safety, which holds that if you just put a dagger in every steering wheel, there'd be fewer automobile accidents because nobody would want to drive recklessly and have a sudden stop. And so if you just make it more dangerous, it will end up safer. It's kind of a crazy theory. That's the theory that the Congress was operating on 
when it established the fiscal cliff. They, in effect, took themselves as hostages, saying that a catastrophic thing would occur if nothing was done to change things on the theory that that would force them to act. That's a little bit odd if you think about it. But given that that decision had been made, we, in fact, did not have the kind of catastrophic tax increases that many people feared. We did not, in fact, have the kind of catastrophic spending cut that many people uh, feared. And we did do something that I at least believe is fundamentally important, which is we did lock in a, an appropriate uh, revenue increase at a time when we have substantial government deficits. So I think it was a reasonable solution as far as it went. I don't think it is a total solution. It's not a total solution because, as I'll discuss, we have some critical growth issues ahead of us in the United States, and it was not a total solution because we still have uh, an adjustment that we're gonna have to make between the long-run path of spending and the long-run path of taxation, and we have more of this dagger in the steering wheel stuff ahead of us because of the debt limit and because of the possibility of a government shutdown um, that lies ahead. So, you know, somebody had, I thought, the right analogy uh, as to how a lot of people in the business world view Washington right now. They said it's like the children in the back seat fighting. You're in the front seat and your children are in the back seat fighting and they're fighting and it seems hugely important to them. And each of the children really wants to explain to you why they're right and it's the other kid's fault. But really, you just want them to work it out and have the fight end. And I think that is how a lot of people in the rest of the world and a lot of people in the business community uh, view what's, uh, what's going on. But I think that um, a good rule for predicting what's going to happen in the United States was Winston Churchill's observation that the United States always does the right thing, but only after exhausting all the alternatives. And I think we will find our way through uh, this fiscal, uh, this, next, uh, this next period. Um, my greater concern is, with, uh, is less with um, what will happen in terms of the debt limit and all of that. I think that there'll be perils of Pauline, it will get to the deadline, but I would be very surprised if uh, it went wrong. I think the greater concern is with uh, what the rate of growth and the rate of job creation will be uh, going forward in the United States. And I think we have had more emphasis in global economic discussion on excessive borrowing and less emphasis on spurring growth than I believe has been appropriate uh, to the challenges uh, that, uh, we are, uh, that we are facing. And I think that's true in the United States. I think that's true in uh, much of Europe, at least until recently, it was uh, true uh, in uh, Japan, and that's a substantial part 
of uh, the global economy. If you, uh, pay if you pay attention to the recent news flow, I was just back in the States for several weeks, uh, property markets picking up, I see the bank repo signs are coming down. Uh, Japan is still an open question, I suppose, in many ways, but Mr. Abe has gotten quite uh, a bounce in the market and quite a reaction in the end just by talking so far. And over the weekend, I don't know when you got into Hong Kong, but over the weekend there was some pretty eyebrow-raising uh, set of numbers out of China in terms of the, uh, the trade situation. It's kind of hard not to be a little more optimistic in the new year than that rough year that we just went through. Do you think the world's a healthier place? Or I think the United States, look, uh, you know, I, I, saw some, I saw a forecaster this morning who, um, relative, somebody with a pretty good track record, who said that they think that U.S. GDP growth in the fourth quarter might be negative. I think that's unlikely. Um, but I think you're looking at growth in the ones in the 1% range for the fourth quarter. And that means you're looking at cumulative growth for the four quarters of 2012 with a one handle, um, not a two handle. And I think we'll do better than that next year. I, I, I would be quite surprised if we didn't do better than one and a half percent. But the problem is that in an economy with an unemployment rate close to 8%, in an economy that the world economy in important respects depends on, two, two and a half percent growth really isn't good enough. And I think the question for the global economy is who has a strategy that doesn't depend on export-led growth and increased competitiveness? The U.S. strategy, rightly, I think, given that we have run chronic trade deficits, the U.S. strategy is heavily about export-led growth. President Obama set a goal of doubling exports over five years. The European strategy, certainly for the countries of the periphery, is about export-led growth. And Germany certainly doesn't appear willing to absorb all the exports uh, as imports. So that means on net, the European strategy is around export-led uh, growth. Certainly, if you listen to what's coming out of Japan, the, uh, a weaker currency and more exports is a central part of what they are recommending. And so their strategy is about export-led growth. Yes, there was just good news out of China, but the good news took the form of they're exporting more than they were expected uh, to export. So the question is, if all of that is going to be export-led growth, the one thing like economists really do know is that the sum of all the exports has to equal the sum of all the imports. So if some places are going to have an improved competitive position and uh, a better trade position, some places have to be importing more. So then the question is, who are those places uh, going to be? And we already talked about the United States, Europe, Japan, and China. That's talking about a large part of the global economy. So what are the other possibilities? You could hope that commodity producers will run smaller surpluses, perhaps because commodity prices will be lower. But it doesn't really seem very likely that global growth is going to surprise and accelerate, and commodity prices are going to end up significantly lower. And so how much of that uh, is, um, uh, so it's not clear how much you're going to get uh, there. And then you have uh, the risk of um, perhaps you will have uh, potentially attractive uh, 
countries that are attractive to invest in borrow more. And, um, but then the question is, how large um, will, uh, will those uh, be? So I think that to an extent that's not fully recognized, some of the collective optimism is a bit lacking a solution to the adding up problem. And that everybody's able to be optimistic, but in part they're able to be optimistic because they think they're gonna export more. And some people are gonna end up being able to export more, but it would be kind of surprising if everybody was able to export uh, more. So I think one should still have uh, a fair amount of uh, caution um, about uh, the global situation. And I must say, I find it um, interesting that uh, measures of volatility, as you infer them from options, the so-called VEX or fear gauge, are really at very surprisingly low levels right now. They're basically back to uh, it varies from measure to measure, but they're basically back to the kind of levels they were before the crisis uh, started. So at one level, that's uh, encouraging. At another level, I, I'm, I think that there's a lot that, um, can, there's a lot that can happen, and uh, I do have these concerns about the adding up issues. Uh, before I go on, Dr. Summers, I do need to apologize. I didn't mean to hijack what was supposed to be a keynote speech with a Q&A, but that's what I do for a living. Are you doing your keynote? Is, are, you, are you actually doing it right now, or do you have prepared remarks which you want I to I had prepared make? remarks, oh, okay. which you have significantly asked me about, so why don't we just keep going this oh, way? Oh, okay, I'm happy like to do that. that. I'm happy to do that if the organizers here are happy to do that. Well, I'm kind of like you. I like talking I more than listening, too. I count myself hijacked. <laughs> you never let that happen. So, um, from what you said, uh, everybody's got this desire to export. They've got this urge to sell. It seems like we're kind of back to square one, like we didn't learn our lessons from the past. I mean, didn't we decide a long time ago that you had to have a, a balanced approach to economic recovery and not just hope that there was some sucker out there that would take your stuff off you? It seems like we're having this conversation 15 years ago. I don't mean you and me specifically, but you get my drift. Well, I think that Look, I think it's gonna be very important for the global economy, and there are many people in this room who are closer to it and follow it in a much more granular way uh, than I do. But what happens in China over the next few years is gonna be absolutely essential uh, in this regard. Over the last 20 years, China has gone from having about 50% of its GDP in the form of consumption, which by global standards is a remarkably low number, to having about one third of its GDP in consumption, which by global standards is a staggeringly low number without any precedent in peacetime. And that's not a sustainable trend as a growth model. And so if you look at where the surplus is and where you could plausibly look for countries to be pulling the rest of the world along, one has to think that for the next five to 10 years, relative to the last five to 10 years, that's China. Now, I think there's a lot of room for discussing the extent to which this is already in train. It does, certainly the RemNB is not saliently, strikingly undervalued in the way that it was five years ago. Certainly it appears that the quantity of currency intervention has come down substantially. And certainly there's been a lot of discussion of domestic demand growth in China. But 
how much that will materialize, how much this, this surprisingly positive trade statistic, see the surprisingly positive trade statistic, I don't know enough to know whether it's a harbinger of a profound trend or a monthly fluctuation, but if it's a harbinger of a profound trend, I don't think it's altogether a happy one from the point of view of the global economy, even though it may point towards uh, more growth uh, for China. So I think China does need uh, to uh, recognize this need for adjustment. I think that Europe will need to be careful about the extent to which it seeks to solve its internal problems by moving into external surplus to a substantial extent uh, in a demand short uh, global, uh, global economy. But yeah, I think these issues have been with us for some time. I mean, look, in, uh, when I was Treasury Secretary in 1999 and 2000, I used to talk about how the world economy couldn't fly on a single American engine and that the United States couldn't have import-led growth forever so that everybody else could have export-led growth. And those issues, I would say, are still um, very, much, uh, very much with us. Look, there's another thing to say that I think is, is just worth understanding as a feature of the global economic environment, uh, and this is what I was gonna was gonna talk a, a certain amount about. You would have thought, if I had told you ten years ago, that in early 2013, the ten-year tips rate, index bond rate, was going to be negative 70 basis points, you would have been very surprised. If I had told you 10 years ago that the U.S. budget deficit in 2012 and 2013 was going to be in the trillion dollar range, you would have been very surprised. And if I had told you 10 years ago that both of those things were true, you would have thought I was smoking something and you would have thought it was inconceivable. And what's the way to understand that? The way to understand that is that in the wake of the financial crisis, in the wake of the bubble, with deleveraging going on, roughly speaking, everybody wants to save, and roughly speaking, nobody wants to spend and invest. And what's our market mechanism for bringing those two things into balance? It's a falling interest rate. And that's why we have such low interest rates. And, but there are limits to how far interest rates can fall because nominal interest rates can't fall below zero. And uh, that's the adjustment process that uh, we're living with. And that in fact, the low interest rates and the budget deficits have a common cause which is the weakness of spending and the desire uh, to save. You can see that, and you can see that that's the right way to understand what's going on by looking at another as a different aspect of market life, which is looking at the correlation between interest rates and stock prices. In normal times, there's some tendency when interest rates go up, for stock prices to go down. After all, higher interest rates mean that you discount the earnings at a higher rate and would tend to mean that stock prices should go down. What's interesting about the pattern of fluctuations in the last several years in the United States, but also in most of the world, is that days when stock prices go on, go up, are also days when interest rates go up. What is that about? That's what, those are the days that people in the market 
call risk on. Or that from an economist's point of view, those are days when expected profitability goes up, and so you have more demand for investment, and when you have more demand for investment, you have more spending, and so people see more demand for borrowing, so interest rates rise, but there's a brighter future, so the stock market rises. And so the thing we have to understand about our current economic environment is that it's actually being driven by concerns about uh, the level of demand and uh, the economic uh, future much more than it's being driven by concerns about the soundness of policy. At least I believe that's true in the major industrial countries that have the capacity uh, to print uh, their own currencies. That's why when I look at the health of the U.S. economy, I think that the, yes, we do have a serious problem that we do need to adjust or address over time of the ratio of how much revenue we're collecting to the amount that we're spending. But if you ask me, how could we really get in trouble fiscally 10 years from now? It's not primarily a risk that Congress will be profligate. The primary risk is that it will turn out that the economy stagnates and grows at 1.5% for the next 10 years rather than 2%, rather than 2.5%. Uh, for the next uh, 10 years. I mean, think about this. In terms of the impact on the debt to GDP ratio in the United States in 2023, the budget deal that was just reached is the equivalent of about 15 hundredths of 1% extra growth. So if we could find something that moved the growth rate by 15 hundredths of a percent, which isn't that much, it would have a larger impact in reducing the debt to GDP ratio than the deal uh, that we reached. So yes, we should do all we can. Yes, it's absolutely the right thing to do. Yes, it will add to confidence, and confidence is very important if we get the fiscal situation under control. But Understanding that we are, in important respects, a demand-short economy is central uh, to understanding uh, our dynamics going forward. Are you ready to face the nation, uh, face the people? Always. Okay. And this is your chance to ask a question to Dr. Summers. Uh, we've got roving mics all over there. This is a really big crowd here. There's one. Do we have any more? You're the only one? There's two. Okay. Uh, who's got a question or comment for Dr. Summers? Don't everybody raise your hand at once. Oh, there's one here. Gentleman in the gray suit. Can you hang on one second? We can't hear you. It's so far away. This must be one of the bigger crowds you've been in front of, huh, Dr. Summers? I'm so glad they built a building this size. There you go, sir. Lawrence, uh, I too am a Lawrence. I prefer to be called Larry. I assume you prefer to be called the same. What would happen if the characters in Washington, and I am a Washingtonian originally, were to suddenly wake up and realize that the country is really broke? Uh, we've got a fellow in the White House who's never run a lemonade stand. He has no concept whatsoever about running a business. We've got a bunch of characters in Washington, and I am generalizing for both houses, who have never run a business. I, as a former practicing lawyer, ran a business. I had to meet the rent every month. I had to meet a payroll. If the bills didn't get paid, I had to go to a bank. Now, if the Congress were to wake up and the White House were to wake up, which I doubt will happen, and say, look, we have to stop borrowing in order to pay the interest on the debt that we have, 
and we've got to develop a sense of fiscal responsibility, what do you think would happen if that were to happen in a perfect world? Sir, with great respect, I, I think we are on uh, quite different wavelengths um, in thinking about uh, these problems. You know, I, I'd say a few things. Uh, first, you know, you, you say, and it's kind of a common thing people say, and it's obviously in some ways it's true, that the president has never run a business. On the other hand, a different way to think about it is that a presidential campaign is an enterprise that starts with nothing and spends a billion dollars and employs thousands of people and gets itself up and running in nine months or a year. So I don't think people manage to start, run, and succeed in getting themselves elected President of the United States in our system without a lot of managerial ability and without the ability to handle meeting a uh, payroll under very difficult and trying uh, circumstances. I also think that you make a mistake and it's a, it's a it's a common mistake that many people make in analogizing the country to a single business. The difference between a business and an economy is this. A business sells to an external world. An economy both buys and sells. The United States is a producer, but the primary consumer of what the United States produces is Americans. That's the difference between the United States and any of the companies represented uh, in uh, this room. So it's the kind of thinking that it's, it's the kind of thinking that you're engaged in, which is everybody should just sell more uh, without thinking about who's going, to be do, who's going to be doing the buying that leads to the kind of adding up uh, problem uh, that, uh, we, uh, that, we have, uh, that we have had. If we were to take literally your suggestion and somehow we were to pass a budget that had as its objective that suddenly the United States wouldn't be borrowing anymore, the result would be a catastrophic collapse in demand that would do huge damage to uh, the global economy. I mean, we have seen that economic philosophy in practice. It was Herbert Hoover's economic philosophy, and it made the Depression great. It was the policy that was pursued in 1937 when we suddenly decided we needed to move towards having a healthy budget and having a central bank that didn't uh, grow its balance sheet. And the result was a 6% increase in the unemployment rate inside of 12 uh, inside of 12 months so I think there's plenty you can argue about and certainly there's plenty that's done by special interests that wouldn't be what I would support and certainly there are things the government does that the government shouldn't do and certainly there's aspects of the way regulation is carried on that doesn't show appropriate sensitivity to business but I think the idea that if you just had a really tough-minded business person who'd met a payroll and you told him to go meet a payroll and make the government profitable, that somehow this would all be okay, that wouldn't be a view that I would uh, subscribe to. Did that, did the gentleman's question sound like a, did it make him sound like a Democrat, or Republican, or Libertarian, or a or Tea Party? I, uh, 
I tr as a professor at Harvard, I transcend or seek to transcend partisanship. <laughs> Another question? Is, that, is your hand raised there, sir? No, there's somebody. Why don't we take one from the front here? Where are the microphones? We'll come to you, sir. Uh, say, I am from India, and I have a question. That, uh, what do you think about the introduction of FDI, foreign direct investment, in India? I'm sorry, I didn't, I wasn't able to, I wasn't, did you follow the question? No, sorry. I wasn't able to, I, I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, I, the acoustics aren't great, I didn't follow the question. What do you think about introduction of FDI, foreign direct investment, in India? Foreign direct investment in India? Yeah. Look, I have enough trouble with American controversies <laughs> without trying to do in, without trying to do uh, Indian controversies. Um, I think he was trying to get your mind I, off things. But um, but my reputation precedes me, and it is not for reticence. Um, so here goes. I think it would be a surprising critique of Indian economic policy that would suggest that the problem with Indian economic policy was that India had been too open to the rest of the world. I think it would be a surprising critique of Indian economic policy that would say that India's problem was that it had been badly under-regulated. I think it would be a surprising critique of Indian economic policy that said that local Indian elites had been subject to excessively brutal competition over time. And so all of those things would suggest to me a presumption that uh, foreign direct investment has not been overwhelcomed. Uh, in India over the last uh, 20 years and would lead one to be supportive of the idea of more openness. I, I say that distinguishing, as I think your question did, foreign direct investment uh, from portfolio capital flows, where it seems to me that a fair-minded person would have to say that the arguments uh, pro and con regulation of hot money capital flows, I think any fair-minded person would have to say that whatever their degree of enthusiasm about complete liberalization with respect to hot money capital flows 10 years ago was, that probably in light of the experience of the last couple of decades, they should be less enthusiastic today. That doesn't necessarily mean they're not the right thing for some places and for some times. But I think the experience has been more cautionary um, with respect to those flows. But I think with respect to foreign direct investment in India, on grounds of reducing rents, on grounds of introducing uh, technology, on grounds of opening up the economy and creating opportunity, uh, it seems to me there'd be a quite strong case for um, a more liberal attitude towards foreign direct investment. Let me interject here for a second. I, was, uh, I had a little FaceTime this morning with the head of the China Investment Corporation, the uh, CIC, and one of the uh, issues he raised with me was what he felt was pretty obvious protectionism, increasing protectionism, uh, you know, as we've witnessed in some of the uh, decisions that President Obama has made on proposed Chinese investment in alternative energy, 
and some other industries. Do you think this is a, a media bias and just highlighting a problem which doesn't really exist, which statistically is insignificant, or do you think it's a very real thing? I'm just kind of wondering, since we're talking about FDI, just wanted to swing it the other way. Is America closing its doors at its peril? Look, uh, I think, uh, first, I, first, I would say that by global standards, I think the United States has a very good track record on maintaining, on my, maintaining its economy as open. That's in part about public policy, and that's in part a cultural thing in terms of the willingness of American businesses to partner with businesses uh, from elsewhere, in terms of uh, the willingness of uh, American consumers to buy products without regards to where they're produced. So I don't think the United States has much to apologize for to others uh, in terms of uh, maintaining uh, openness. Is this kind of thing a concern? Uh, yes, I think it is uh, a uh, concern. I think if we had described, I, I, I made a couple of remarks before about if I had said, if I described to you what was going to happen 10 years ago and I had told you various things. I think if you had described how serious the 2008 and onwards financial crisis was going to be. And you had said, how much economic nationalism is there gonna be in the world? You would have predicted that there would be more economic nationalism than there has been. So yes, the Doha round hasn't been completed. Yes, there are examples you can point to of uh, economic uh, nationalism. But I think that in the fullness of it all, you'd have to say that the world has done pretty well. I think there are two issues that are raised when you discuss China, particularly uh, in this uh, regard, and they're, they're complicated uh, to evaluate in both respects. One is, how do you think about the question of investments made by private sector companies that have heavy government involvement? You know, there are many countries, there are many companies in China that are in some ways like AT&T was in the United States 30 years ago. 30 years ago, AT&T was a private U.S. company, but it was a private U.S. company that was heavily, heavily engaged with government. And so when you think about it making an investment, that's kind of a government making an investment. And depending on what the sector is, I don't think it's illegitimate for that to enter into uh, the thinking. The other issue, and it's an issue that exists in trade, it's an issue that exists in financial services, it's an issue that exists in many categories, is let's assume there's none of that issue, and let's assume that the best thing for the global economy, for American economic welfare, or whatever the host country's economic welfare, is an open market with respect to foreign investment. But let's assume, and I think this would be the testimony of a great deal of American business, that investing in China is not without its complexities. There are failures with respect to the protection of intellectual property. There are other kinds of expropriations uh, that uh, they think take place. How should what happens in China to American businesses affect what happens in America to Chinese uh, businesses? I don't think those are 
100% illegitimate uh, questions. So I suspect that if I personally were the decision maker on every single transaction that has been considered, that our regime would have been somewhat more liberal and more permissive than the one that's taken place. But I think one does have to keep some perspective on the fact that this is a two-way, that this is a two-way street. And I think that China in particular, um, as it has gained remarkable economic strength and has had the kind of miraculous performance that it has had over the last uh, 20 years, um, has to recognize that notions of symmetry are going to be more important in the economic dialogue than they were at a time when China was seen as a desperately poor country seeking to develop. And I think that's just part of the, uh, part of the underlying economic reality. Dr. Summers, it's uh, been a pleasure. How long are you in town for this trip? I think you're, you're, you're speaking again tomorrow. Here I'm forum. here for a couple days. Okay, and then where? Back to? Uh... Then back to, back to the United States. Okay, you know Jack Liu very well, by the way? I do know Jack Liu. He is a very good friend. We served uh, mm -hmm. together in uh, both President Clinton's administration when I was Treasury Secretary and he was the Director of the Office of Management and Budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, during President Obama's administration when uh, I was uh, directing the National Economic Council and he was uh, first at the State Department and uh, then uh, OMB uh, director. He is a person of great character, of great commitment uh, to doing the right uh, thing in economic policy. He is a person who is highly, highly respected by everybody he engages with. And I think in a town where not everybody is seen as behaving every day in adult ways, Jack Glue is seen as a total adult. So I was uh, just delighted when uh, President Obama uh, picked him to succeed Tim Geithner, and I don't think uh, President Obama could have made a better choice than uh, Jack Liu. By the way, I want to explain that before we part ways. You saw the young lady holding that sign up on this side of the room and said, last five minutes, last minute. If you knew what real estate prices and rents were like in Hong Kong, you'd understand. But they rent it by the minute here, so we're going to have to wrap it up here, okay? Dr. Summers, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.